watching No to Nine. Hello, and welcome to No to Nine. I'm David Leedy. Episode 72, Domino Designer Review, MW Lug Presentation, Part 1. Okay, so this is uh, hopefully the first part in about a five part series that I'm going to do where I took the, the presentation that I did recently at uh, MW Lug in Pittsburgh. And I'm going to break it up into about five parts, one for like each topic that I kind of focused on. And and if you haven't been out to to a user group, uh, that UK lug I know just just ran a, a little bit ago, and MW lug, and and there's IM lug that took a year off, but I believe is going to be back next year. And and ski lug, if you like skiing, there's a ski lug version, and there's Dan notes and Belgium lug and Australia lug. I mean, they're just all over the world. So you really want to just make some time and try to go. To one of these things. There's a lot of great people. Uh, a good time is had by all, and, and it's worth your while. Uh, a good time is also had by all uh, very late in the bar, uh, but that's a different screencast. So what I did was, I did this session called Notes and Line Live, uh, the X Pages edition. And I didn't like the title, but uh, I was out of time on abstract submission, and I didn't know what I was going to talk about, so I kept it a little generic. So anyway, what we're going to talk about mostly today is designer, but the other things I'm going to talk about in some future episodes from this presentation is at functions versus code, uh, mobile controls, X pages, uh, or the extension library controls, and we're going to finally start talking more about Java, uh, because I think uh, the, the Java core language, not just Java objects this time, because I think there's way too much fear out there for uh, what it's worth, and, and it's, it's good that we start learning this stuff. Okay, so first thing I want to talk about is DDE, and DDE is what we kind of call Domino Designer for Eclipse. You know, it's been Eclipse for a long time now. It's really just Domino Designer, if you ask any IBMer, I'm sure, and especially Maureen, who who used to manage the product or so. But but it's Domino Designer that's that's based inside Eclipse, and Eclipse gives us a lot of things uh, in different editors and 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 different capabilities and and different uh, perspectives and things like that. But Eclipse is kind of big. And it uses memory. And so you, you do want to kind of pay attention to how it uses memory and what you can do to help yourself. And there's this file called JVM Properties, which you can change and some settings on there to give more memory available to your Domino Designer. And more memory available to Domino Designer is a very good thing, typically. So it lives in typically in your Lotus IBM Framework RCP Deploy directory. Because course. I mean, where else would you want to put it? So there's this file called JVM that you can edit, and the default size is for XMX is 256 megabytes, and XMS is 48 megabytes. And I believe XMX is, is 256 is, is the maximum kind of available to it that Eclipse is going to use. XMS, I believe, is, is the starting level, but I'm not sure. Um, uh, probably a better screencast, you would know this, but this is a free screencast, and I forget. I was once told, but I have since forgot. Um, so the only trick here is XMS, the number has to be divisible nicely by four. Uh, and as Paul, uh, my barbecue is better than everybody else's, uh, Calhoun likes to say, don't go nuts. So be careful there. But you, you can bump it up safely. And before I go on, let, let's just take a quick peek at how that works. So if we do File and come down to Preferences, and uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? General. Oh, I'm on there. And we, there's this little, little thing called show heap status. So if we hit apply to that, it's going to say using 92 of 141 so far. And as we open databases, this stuff's going to change. And if we hover over it, you can see the max is 256. I could probably even bump this up to 512 if, if this uh, virtual machine here has 250, has two gigs of memory so play with it see what works for you um, because as you you know do this stuff all day long and, and you're moving around you know these things do stay open um, I don't know if there's a good way to just close it without actually removing it um, other than restarting designer so again you, you do eat up memory uh, as as you go along in your day so you can see that oh and here's a little little thing here with the preferences that even though you keep this checked uh, when you restart designer it's gonna forget all about it um, it's, it's a little bug there it doesn't honor this check so you're gonna have to hit apply if you want to see it again 
Okay, so the other thing that Eclipse gives us, because of all these editors and everything else, is all these preferences. And I did kind of a show highlighting uh, an article that Nathan Freeman wrote, and you can see that at the bottom here. If you Google for Nathan Designer Tweaks, it's this great article on how to customize Eclipse to just work better for you. I want to just highlight a couple of them here. Uh, the first one is, well, spell checking. Because I don't know about you, but you don't need to you know, spell check in source code. So if you come down to general, and then editors, text editors, and then spelling, I don't, I don't really need that in my coding environment. So we, we can turn that off right here. Now, no, oops. Now another one I, I like to do is um, preferences. And if we come down to XML. And then um, XML files, and then editor. Okay, the line width can be bumped up um, to 140 or, or maybe more, depending on what you what you prefer. Um, oh, don't turn align final brackets on; that'll that'll look ugly. But split multiple attributes on each new line. That is really nice to do. Um, uh, syntax coloring is in here somewhere. If we come down here. I like to turn for oops, C date data content th this yellow, which I believe Nathan suggested, and that'll show you kind of really highlight that you're using a lot of JavaScript in there and stuff like that. So that kind of helps make it stand out, and it's just and what that other one does that that where was it here? This split multiple attributes on each line. So see how this attribute, these attributes like name and foreground is on the same line. So it's going to put each attribute on its own line. And it's it does take up more space, but it is so much easier to read as you're dealing with source. And as you do more with the extension library, you do more with source. So uh, if you think you can avoid the source pain, as, as I've been trying to, you can't. So you might as well make it look as nice as, as you can. Okay, fonts, you can change fonts, but the font is, you might have to change it multiple places for each editor, uh, and I prefer Consolas as, as uh, my preferred font. Okay, so that's basically the designer demo. Uh, the other thing I talked about is source control, and, and you want to use source control. Now, I think I have at least two shows in detail on how to install source control, how to get started with it, what to do with it. So if you're, if you're not doing that, please start trying to do that. There's a free source control server out there for Bitbucket. Um, you can set up your own with Bitnami uh, fairly easily if you want to have everything in-house. Um, it's worth your while to do this. Uh, and it's worth your while even if you work alone. Um, you know, even my personal projects I put under source control. I'm not going to work in a team. Source control has nothing to do with design locking or, or you know, don't step on my toes kind of thing or so. It's about code safety. It's about storing the history of your changes, giving the ability to roll back to any version, and branching. Uh, branching is extremely cool. Uh, you can also integrate source control with uh, some different project management pieces like Redmine or something else, and it just helps you create better documentation. All right, so what is branching? Well, let's just look at this screenshot here, and and you can see I started a database for this for the conference here with the initial uh, database, and I started, and I modified it, and then right around here I I created a branch, this Java branch, and I did all this Java mods here, and then I forgot I was in a branch, so I was still working on non-Java stuff within this Java branch because I'm an idiot, and but it doesn't matter. And then what happened is is I wanted to show you this, so I I switched back to the original branch and made a small change here, and that's what kind of made this graphical uh, fork here, so that I ended up with two branches. I had a change in the original branch, and I had all this work in the Java branch, and then when I was done with this, and I merged the two to this, you know, to back to one branch, and then I just moved on with life. So this gives you the ability, what it does is allows you to switch from one code fork to another. So maybe you have your 1.0 code. Okay, and now here at this green, you're working on some new features. And you're just happy as a clam working on new features. And then someone calls you about the production one, which says, oh, there's a bug in it. We need this bug fixed. Okay, but I've got all this stuff here. And if I do a refresh design, it's all going to go in and 
you might not be ready for that. Well, that's what branching does. It, it manipulates your NSF file, so you can you can basically swap out all this design back to the original design, to design, fix this little bug, and then switch back to this branch and go on, and then eventually merge it. So branching is very powerful. It's a, it's a good way to live, especially if you're you're you've got a production environment and and you've got different code things. It's it's just so much safer. Okay, so I did mention Bitbucket already. Um, what this, what Bitbucket is, is, is it's a free source out there. It's a free cloud-based server that works with with uh, our source control uh, very well. And, and I have that in one of my previous shows on there. And I just want to show you that this is the repository from Bitbucket. And you can even see, you know, you can drill through here and you can see, you know, the code. Basically, so it's, that's just kind of neat to have all your code on the web. You can access it from anywhere. It's easy to share if need be, or if you want to bring another contributor on there. Um, and again, it's just a good way to work. So the gist of source control is you create a local copy on your your local machine. It's not a replica because that's what source control does. Source control moves the source around, and then you attach it to source control. Uh, you can, if you're joining a product uh, project. You can go up to the repository and you can create an NSF right from that source control that's in the repository. You basically, as you make changes, you can put comments in about them and then you push the changes to the server and it's now it's safe. It's locked in. It's not going to go anywhere. Um, and, and you just have a lot of capabilities and it's great to answer the question of, well, what did you do yesterday? You know, or this bug is coming. Well, what did I fix around that time or what changes went in? Um, so again, I do have some detailed videos available, and uh, I do want to just do a shout out for my coworker, friend, and boss, who's uh, Declan Lynch, who kind of invented all, came up with the original presentation on how to use source control, and taught me how to use all this. Um, and that's what we do in the day job, and it works extremely well. So I don't know if there's a really a demo needed for that uh, with going over the screenshots like that. So we'll move on. Okay, a couple things you need to have in your toolbox is the first one is import custom controls from OpenNTF and I talked about this in, in notes 966 and what that is is and I'm not going to do it all here but if I right click here on the database it's already set up but I've got this OpenNTF thing here so if I import this a reusable control from OpenNTF I can go to the Apache library and, and here's the one you want oh, not that one here's the one you want not that this is bad, but this is the one you want. The X page is Debug Toolbar by Mark uh, Lusink, and I hope that was pronounced correctly or so. And this, you just get this in your application. You can drop it on any page. It will show you your scoped variables. It will show you, you know, all sorts of stuff that's going on. So it's a really good tool for debugging it, uh, at least until, especially until the um, server-side JavaScript debugger which is rumored to be out in 8.54, actually does come out in 8.54, and, and hopefully that rumor will actually become fact, because uh, I believe they did say that publicly that it would. But I'm not IBM, so I say rumor. So the other thing that you want to do from OpenNTF is get the X Pages log file reader. And someone tweeted, um, oh, guy, I forget her name, um, Cool V, or, or I forget her name, but someone said that, uh, Victoria, I think it was, said that it does work on like 8.5.2. So I don't believe, I did look at it for somebody, it does not require the extension library, I don't think. So you can use it on some older versions of the server. So let, let's just take a look at look at that for a second. Okay, so if I go to uh, my, my web browser here. And this is what it is. This is the, the log file reader. And this is the tab that's that's really of, of interest here. This X pages log. And you can scroll down here to the most recent ones at the bottom. Kind of wish it was reversed. But if you look at that, you know, it shows you these exceptions. You know, and it, it gives you some fairly good detailed information about what's going on, where it is, the stack trace. So, but where is this important? Sometimes you get, you know, these errors on the console, but it didn't actually stack trace to your browser. Okay, well, well here they are. So now you can see what they are. You know, so if it didn't, if it didn't trigger the browser hitting the stack trace, um, you can you can now see them. Uh, so that is, we have that on all our servers production as well, and it, that that is a godsend that log file reader project. Let me tell you. Okay, so here's just a screenshot of of Mark's 
debug control which you can put in it throws this bar up up on the top here and so here I had clicked on session scope or he did I think I stole the screenshot from somebody and and you can just see the different variables that are that are out there in the session scope um, here's a here's a hash map um, you know it's probably isn't that interesting without more custom variable names or so but if you have something in, in a different scope and want to see what what the contents are uh, it's there and I believe there's a way yeah, you can clear the session scope uh, right from here if you want to test something again um, etc so it's it's worth your while to have that available to you and that is a, a quick overview of of you know the first part of my presentation uh, hope that at least made some sense I know I went fairly quick today on that uh, I'm gonna, I want to try and slow down for some of the more uh, interesting things that are coming up in the next couple shows. So if you have any questions for me, here's my contract contact information. And uh, I'm in the middle of this drive, or beginning, I guess, this Drive to 99 event, trying to get to 99 shows by December 9th. So here's hoping that works. And uh, I thank you for your time.